Welcome back to the Unmasked Podcast, where we are unmasking compromise, which cowards and wolves, showing you what biblical Christianity is not, so that you may better understand what it is. I'm your host, Tyler Long. This is my co-host and brother in Christ, Joey Durantz. We are season two, episode five here. Joey, we talked about uh, unity last time, and it was mostly within the context of a local church. And now we're going to get into what unity will look like uh, between churches. So inner church unity, the the universal body of Christ. Right? Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, I am too. And so just as a recap, uh, we'll go over what the basis, purpose, and nature of true biblical Christian unity is, but we're not going to go as deep. So if you want to get a better framework, go back to the last episode yeah. and watch that. But so the basis of the unity is the Trinity. We The unity that we see in the Trinity, Jesus prayed that uh, we would be one as he and the Father are one, right? Uh, the purpose is to radiate the glory of God, lead others to faith, and to lead believers to maturity. And the nature is that we are unified in mind and spirit, not just external uniformity um, or an agree to disagree. So those same principles apply. Now, naturally, you're not going to have the same administration because the local church is going to have uh, elders and an authority to um you know, exhort and encourage and push believers toward these things within the local church that you're not going to have inner uh, in between churches, right? But it doesn't change the nature of it. No, right. right? And the goal and everything is going to be the same. The outlook of it might be a little bit different, um, but scripture and our worship and the church is all regulated, or everything's regulated by scripture, rather, I should say. Yeah. The church and the outworking of the church. Different churches are at different stages with different issues. And so God, in his kindness and in his grace, has given us a measure of liberty on what that's supposed to look like. But there's a lot of things that are there that are unchangeable, undisputable, undeniable. Yeah, yeah. So a good picture of proper unity, even in the midst of disagreement in between churches, would be like John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul. They had a deep friendship. One is uh, a Pado baptist one's a Credo baptist um, They had other doctrinal differences, but, you know, it does, they didn't stop exhorting each other to pursue what they believe the Bible taught. Yeah, and they didn't stop teaching it within their congregations. Right, right. Yeah. But they knew that this was secondary, truly. One's right, one's wrong. Yeah. They, they, neither one of them would shy away from that fact. Um, but they, they loved one another. Just, um, they weren't going to let that minor disagreement get in the way of, of that love. Right? Yeah. So we have an example today. We gave you examples last time of you know either completely false basis for unity or pursuing it the wrong way within a church. And we have an example today of pursuing unity between churches or within the body of Christ universal that is wrong and not biblically based. And we've had this uh, particular, it's not a sermon, it's it's more of a, a coffee talk, but it was given on a Sunday uh, in place of a sermon that um, we've had on our radar for a long time. And that's uh, some of you church Back during uh, COVID, during the George Floyd riots, um, the pastor there, um, his uh, pastor Michael Hearn, he had a guest, Wendell Robinson, on from Mount Olivet Baptist Church. Pastor Michael is white, uh, Wendell Robinson is black. And in the context of all those race tensions and uh, the George Floyd killing and er everything that was going on, BLM and all that, they had this sit down. And so they were seeking a unity, and we'll, we'll delve into what it is was the basis of that. Here's our first clip. For the viewers to know that um, Michael and I have a friendship um, that has been built mm -hmm. over a number of years. And it's because of that friendship that we're even yeah. able to sit here right now, uh, because trust is critical. And, and before we aired... Um, we were just both praying and, and my prayer of thanksgiving is thank you, God, for creating a safe zone mm -hmm. um, where we can, we can talk and we're, we're, we're beginning at that place of, of trust, which is kind of like the foundation. Yeah. And it gives us permission and grace yeah. to, Amen. to be honest with one another and, yeah. and be encouraging to what yeah. God is doing. Yeah. So how, how's, you know, okay. just to start so... Off. They have a basis that they're even able to sit there and talk. It's, he said that it's because of our friendship that we're even able to sit here. So they're starting from a framework that there should be animosity between a white person and a black person to discuss the truths of scripture. Um, and they, 
only a friendship is going to be able to uh, bridge that gap. Not a unity in Christ. Yet, it's hard to even figure out where to start with this. You think about, um, imagine the Apostle Paul saying something like that, <laughs> like going to Ephesus and saying, I'm so glad we have this common you know, friendship and that this is a safe place for me to speak to you about Christ. Now, I know that's believer with non-believers, but we're, Paul walked into hostile situations all of the time. He was constantly in a hostile situations speaking the truth. The, the thing that we should be building our commonality on when it comes to evangelism is that we're all created in the image of God. We all walk on his earth. We're all sinners and Christ is Lord and we're all commanded to repent and believe the gospel. Yep. The commonality that we should have within the church should be that, as we spoke of last time, that unity in the, the bond of peace that we have through the Holy Spirit that he brings and that direction that we're given to keep that unity is given in scripture. Yeah. So, I mean, as a pastor and even as just as a faithful Christian involving yourself in ministering one another's, you know that there's a lot of difficult conversations that at times you have to have with people. And there's conversations sometimes you don't even want to be part of, that, but yeah. you know that, that you have to. Yeah. And, and there's times you have to have conversations with people you don't know that well, but they, they, they have to be there. And it's not about whether, whether we have a, a, a friendship to be able to discuss things. And it's not about even um, how, well you, you, yeah, how well you know the person or if this is a safe place to do it. It's about what does love to Christ re require in this situation? Yeah, and, yeah. And it's going to be easy to uh, nitpick somebody's words. I'm sure it'd be easy to nitpick something that we've said over one of our episodes if it's just that way. And we don't want to do that. We don't create straw man here purposely. Um, but I think you're going to see as we go over all these clips that there's a consistent theme here. Yeah. It's not just this one little clip. And so um, let's go to clip number two. And especially after cl clip number three, this, these themes are going to become even more clear. What I feel like is that, well, I feel a couple things. I feel like now we have this incident with, with George Floyd uh, uh, where he was brutally murdered and convicted on the street in front of the world to see. And it's like you can't deny it. Mm -hmm. um, but we have the incident of the shotgun case um, just before that. And, and you can kind of just keep going, right? Um, but right now the, the whole world is rising up. Mm -hmm. And so I, I feel like um, that there is this kind of reckoning, this reconciling that's happening of uh, an injustice and a wrong that we have carried for 400 years that is um, front and center and it doesn't okay. feel like it's going so he, he's talking about of course the, the a reckoning and reconciling that's happening um of course bad things can happen uh as a result of god's judgment uh, that we would not deny we would affirm that but he's saying reconciling like is that biblical like that the world is being reconciled but there, there, again there's a lot going on here that it's so that this is the problem is because the, like you mentioned before the framework that they're operating off of is foreign to scripture right and so it's it's hard it's a little bit harder to go after these things without going after that underlying worldview and this is one of the reasons why i think so many faithful men fought against the sbc taking on critical race theory as a useful analytical tool because yep. you can't use critical race theory without adopting the whole of the worldview and and it's one of those things that with some people it just sneaks in there yeah and and you don't even realize how much of it of your mind has been pervaded by it so it, the whole world is rising up and there's this reconciliation happening over this injustice if we were just to tackle that phrase a little bit the whole world we're uniting around uh, the the wrongful death of a non-believer right 
we're, we're uniting around that. This person's a non-believer, and we're going to unite around that, and we don't even know if that was racially motivated. No, we don't know that. So we, there's we just a know. lot of presuppositions that are imported into this conversation that they just take for granted and they don't even establish. It, it could be possible that two people of different ethnicities could have a grievance with one another that's not based upon the, the tone of, or the color of their skin. It not only be. is it not possible, that's in 2022 America, that's the genesis of, of most hatred and disagreements. Yeah. Jesus says in John 17, which is that basis for unity that he's praying for. He says, I'm not praying for the world. Right. He explicitly says that. Right. And, and we shouldn't be taking our cues from the culture or our cues from the world. Recons- and, and if you want to talk about an injustice, like why do, why do bad things happen to good people? They don't. Right. That only happened once. Yep. And he volunteered. Mm-hmm. There's the only injustice that we see in Acts 2, and that was according to God's predetermined plan. Yeah. And, and it pleased Yahweh to crush him. Right. So that he would bear the sins of many. And when we talk about reconciliation, the best place to go to that has it just so dense is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Yep. And Paul says the motivating factor behind his life, the thing that rallied him, was not the death of a non believer. He says this the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this that one died for all. Therefore, all died. You can't help but see the, those tones of messiahship of George Floyd in that worldview. Yeah. That he's the one that's uniting us and reconciling us. Right. And then tagging people or tagging things onto that, their worldviews onto that, so that now, even if we don't even know if George Floyd held a critical race theory, but now he's become the, the poster boy, so to speak, for that, and people are latching their worldviews on. Paul continues, he died for all so that they would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. If anyone is in Christ, therefore he is a new creation. Old things passed away, behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And so God's recon- in Christ is reconciling the world to himself, so people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. So it's in Christ that this reconciliation is to happen, not in anything else, not in anyone else, not with any other worldview or presuppositions, but in Christ and in Christ alone. Right, 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 exactly. And, you know, they could try to quote 2 Corinthians 5, 19 there, where it says that God in Christ is reconciling the world to himself. But if they keep reading, it says what the world means, and that's not counting their trespasses against them. So who's the world they're talking about here? Believers. Because believers are the only ones who don't have their trespasses counted against them. Yeah, believers Everyone else does. from every walk of life. Right, exactly. And, and no, no matter how you slice it, you can't, you can't take the death of a non-believer. Right. Even, and we recognize there's obvious um, what appeared to be abuse of authority there. Right. I mean, we're not condoning any, anything of that, but we're just analyzing that situation and saying, should we, as Christians, who do not recognize people according to the flesh, but we are to recognize them according to the Spirit in Christ, should we be rallying around a, a racial situation that's being propagated, especially when it's being driven by non-believers with a non-believing worldview who are still slaves to their sin and under the power of Satan and children of wrath. Yeah, no, their worldview is diametrically opposed. Now, if you see an injustice, we are the pillar and support of the truth, but you can never cure an injustice that doesn't have a precise prescription. For example, if there's people being enslaved, you know the solution there. You stop enslaving them, right? So, even in the whole George Floyd thing, it, they, it's, it's spoken just like Satan, you know, cloaked in, you know, morality and, and you know, an appearance of virtue, but the, the devil's in the details. And so they, there's no pre- precise prescription here. That's how you know it's faulty. No, it begins- how do you stop? Okay, so I just stop being racist because I'm white? Like, and you'll get into this. Like, yeah. the pastor's like, well, what do we need to do? Like, we'll get into that. But, it, like, it it's assume that you're guilty. Yeah, it begins with that presupposition of division. You have two federal heads. Yeah. You have George Floyd and you have uh, Derek something. I forget yeah. what his Derek name Derek Chauvin. 
Chauvin. Yeah. So those are your two federal heads, and and the and it's racial heads yeah. at that. And yeah. and then whatever the one person has done to the other person, all those who look similar are to receive the reward from that. Yep. Yep. Well, let's uh, go to clip number three here. He builds on builds on some of these themes. Partner with him, and in this particular case, writing a four hundred year wrong, and his ultimate goal that we are aware of biblically is the ministry of reconciliation, mm. reconciling us to yeah. him yeah. and one another. Yeah. Um, and um, it begins with the church. Like we, we have to be on the front lines of this. Mm -hmm. um, you, 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 you've heard of Edmund Burke and you know yeah. that quote. I mean, all it takes is just for a few good men to do nothing for evil to prevail, right? Mm -hmm. And this is our opportunity. This is our moment as the church, as the body of Christ to not just spew rhetoric or spin um, sermons, mm -hmm. but to actually be the church with the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us, guiding us, giving us wisdom and insight, navigating the, the tricky waters. Mm -hmm. um, so there we go. And it's, we just talked about how you need to have an accurate prescription. That you can't go to your brother and say, you're in sin, be better. You know, like, no, you're in sin because of X, Y, Z. You need to repent of that and do A, B, C. Yeah, put on, put off. Right, put on, put off. He doesn't do that. He, he says that there's, you know, we can't just speak in platitudes and that we need to be the church. Okay, tell me what, they never say what that looks like. What does that practically look like? What are you talking about? I can give you a verse. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. This isn't talking about marriage primarily. This is talking about any in spiritual endeavor, especially with respect to the church. Mm -hmm. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness or harmony, or what harmony has Christ with Belial or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever or what agreement has a sanctuary of God with idols for we are a sanctuary of the living God just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And it, and it continues on. But we, again, we can't be adopting worldviews that come from the culture or come from the world. Right. If we're going to respond to things, and I think the church should respond to things and it should respond to issues, especially when they, when they are occupying everybody's TV sets and therefore occupying their minds, we need to be crystal clear and direct and we need to take our cues from scripture and speak the truth if we're going to do that ministry of reconciliation how how does paul prescribe that we're to do that ministry of reconciliation so then we are ambassadors for christ as god is pleading god is pleading through us we are ambassadors for christ we don't get to speak our own narrative we don't get my my col the color of my skin is is stripped away it's the content of my heart. God is pleading through me. I'm an ambassador of Christ. I don't get to speak my own words. I'm to speak the words that I am given. I'm a herald. I'm to repeat those words. So I need to have my mind filled with scripture so that I can speak that forward. And the most important thing that the culture is going to need is going to be the gospel. Yep, absolutely. That's the only way any of this is fixed. But when he said it needs to start with it, the church, it's 100% true that we reconcile one another first. But I heard him as saying that this reconciliation with the wider world needs to start with the church leading the charge on these racial, racial issues. That's what I heard him say. Um, I guess we can be charitable and not say definitively that that's what he said, but it would be consistent with the, the rest of these quotes and, and clips that we're going to have because you're going to see that, that it's basically the white pastor saying to the black pastor, what do we, meaning white church people, need to do, right? And so it's going to be, that's that basis, like, that, yes, we're going to lead the charge, and then uh, we're going to cure this evil in the world, this perceived evil that they have. 
And so that would be wrong, right? That the church is supposed to lead a reconciliation with the world, unless you mean preaching the gospel. Yeah. That absolutely, that is the only reconciliation. We should be reconciled to one another because we are reconciled to one another. Mm -hmm. And obviously racism is a sin. Yep. Uh, just like any other sin. But a white person killing a black person because of hatred in his heart is not akin to racism. Yep. Unless you have a definitive proof of motive. Correct. <laughs> so that's a sinful false judgment. And so not only do you sinfully falsely judge Derek Chauvin, not that there's not enough to judge him on, there is, but you attribute a sin to him that there is no evidence of, and you falsely judge everyone else with the same melanin count based on what he's done. Jesus says that it's interesting because I wonder if, if, uh, if a lot of these people propagating this kind of worldview would say, judge not when you're correcting yeah. their doctrine right when we are supposed to judge and everybody does judge yep. and when you say that you're judging someone but in john seven twenty four, jesus says that we're not to judge according to appearance we're to judge with righteous judgment yeah exactly exactly so next clip you're going to see him uh build on this we're going to see what he means uh by reconciliation within the church and between churches i mean church universal know um that uh, he will show you uniquely mm. you know what yeah. what your role and is and that's my prayer now yeah. just even having the conversation it's just um what's the next step or mm -hmm. where to go from from here or how to um how to not only me personally right mm -hmm. and then as the body of christ <clears throat> here at some of you mm -hmm. to um to better reflect christ in this area mm -hmm. of of the church mm -hmm. not only in the conversation maybe that has been ignored for a long time mm -hmm. not to have this conversation but even <clears throat> to take proactive steps yeah absolutely. in reconciliation absolutely um to make sure there is you know high priestly prayer john 17 yeah jesus is praying for for unity how are they going to know of me you know because <laughs> right. your love for one another <laughs> right. and that's love for one another is not people that are just like you it's yeah one another that's right uh and so and that's yeah. some of my mind spinning right mm -hmm. now is this how do i how do I do that? And, and to be honest, and we talked a little bit about this, there's a little bit of fear. Sure. Because I, I, I want to do right. I, I want to honor God. Uh, I, I want to bring that. I want to make mistakes. But there's a little bit of, is this right? Is this, yeah. is this the right way to go? Absolutely. Is this the right step to take Absolutely. in that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and I appreciate I it. just already your wisdom just in having some of those conversations. Yeah. And uh, like you said, even grace. <laughs> yeah in the conversation to yeah. say okay yeah we uh, need a lot of grace oh, yeah, in this moment right. and that's the hard thing about social media and some okay. of the conversations um so is because why is it assumed that one entire group of christians that are categorized by a melanin count have something they need to do to reconcile to another group of christians with a different melanin count based on t the actions of unbelievers in the wider world because you deny christ that's the only logical answer and if you if you're listening and you're disagreeing and you're thinking it, we've got to go beyond the gospel you don't understand the gospel colossians 3 therefore since you have been raised up or if you have been raised up with christ keep seeking the things above where christ is keep seeking seated at the right hand of god set your mind on things above not on things that are on the earth for you died and your life has been hidden with christ in god when, and then he, he keeps going on and he, and he tells you to put to death the members of your earthly body and he lists these sins and, and, he, and he just keeps going and going. And then he talks about in verse nine, do not lie to one another since you put off the old man with its evil practices and have put on the new man who is being renewed to a full knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man, but Christ is all and in all. So we don't pretend like these, that like there's not racism, but at the same time, we're not gonna broaden that out to a bunch of people that might not be racist right. at all, that we don't even, people we don't even know, and just like you said, judge people falsely based on their skin color. But if you want that reconciliation, you can't just tell people with sinful hearts, be better, right. do better. Right. They need Christ. And that's where the unity takes place. And if you think that the racism between black and white is, is extremely bad, multiply that by a much larger 
uh, integer and you'll find the racism between Jew and Gentile. Absolutely. It was the word because that's Jew. Think about that. Jew and Gentile. Yep. When you think black and white, you still have like Hispanic, yep. Asian, but Jew and Gentile, that's everybody. That's Jewish supremacy. Yeah. So Jews yeah. versus every, if you're not Jew, a Jew, you're a Gentile. Yep. And, and he, Christ breaks down that barrier, that division wall yep. in his own flesh. So the only way that that's ever going to be overcome is, and this is, this is one of those principles that seems counterintuitive, and it is counterintuitive depending on how you grew up, but it's not illogical. You preach Christ. You preach Christ to people because when you're preaching Christ, that's where the reconciliation happens. If you're preaching social justice, you're never going to be able to accomplish what you're hoping to accomplish in terms of bringing that unity because that unity can only happen in Christ. It's like what the Bible teaches, do you want to be happy? Don't pursue happiness, pursue holiness. Because the closer you get to Christ, the more you'll have that happiness that's not based on circumstances, but based in a divine person. Yeah, they, they clearly do not have their eyes fixed on Christ. They, it could be established that America is rabidly racist. And there is systemic injustice, as they say. I don't agree with that assessment. I think, of course, there's individual races. Of course, duh. Those are two different arguments. But let's just say every single accusation that the CRT crowd makes is 100% right, that there's systemic racism, injustice, and America is mostly racist. Two Christians still should not be having this conversation between each other based on their skin color because of what's happening in the world. Instead of sitting there and letting this white guy, he's almost uh, patronizing him, uh, he's either patronizing or, or uh, sycophantic, uh, this, this pastor, um, Michael Hearn. And instead of accepting that and like just letting him continue in sin, Wendell Robinson should be rebuking him and saying, listen, we're brothers in Christ. We're one family. Stop talking to me like you have something to repent of. Stop talking to me like there's any reconciliation that needs to exist between us. It's been paid in Christ. We're one family right now. You and I need to reconcile just as much as two children and a family need to reconcile who were adopted from birth, but are two different races. If there's a white child and a black child that grew up in the same family uh, from adoption, and then the George Floyd killing happens, are they gonna like go to each other and be like, brother, we need to reconcile? <laughs> No, they're family. They're family, man. Yeah. And so they have such a small view of the unity that exists in Christ. They're taking their eyes off Christ. Yeah, it, you do this. We would do the same thing with any with a, abortion. You're not just going to spend your whole time just talking about why abortion is evil. You're going to be preaching Christ. Yeah. Because you're not going to be able to have a right mind and be able to see things clearly unless you're seeing things in Christ. Yep. We yep. have to have a renewed mind. Right. No, absolutely. And, and their mind is, is, is darkened in this area. Not saying they're not Christians, don't know anything, but Christians can lose track. The Apostle Paul had to get rebuked by Paul. Or, excuse Peter. me, the Apostle Peter yeah. <laughs> had to get rebuked by Paul because he was engaging in, in sin because his mind was closed off and taking it off of Christ. Yeah, and racism. Yeah, he was guilty of racism. That's yeah. right. And guess what? He got rebuked because there's a specific instance that you can point to and he didn't say all Jews are now guilty. He went to his brother, Paul, uh, Peter, and told him his sin. And that's exactly the model. And that's what should happen. So, Pastor Robinson, if you are aware of racism or the sin of partiality, is how the Bible calls it, in your brother, Pastor Hearn, then tell him his sin. But don't just sit here and ramble incessantly about some you know, conceptual racism that exists in the outside world and pretend like that has something to do between two brothers. It doesn't, unless you want to be unified in how we're going to preach the gospel. How are we going to use this to preach the gospel? Maybe there's a way, an angle that we can bring the gospel to people. Like, that'd be a fruitful discussion. Yeah, there's, there's spiritual solidarity that's going on, isn't there? Yeah. A lot of the people that, that were getting angry against uh, Derek Chauvin and the things that they were saying, while they were saying it for George Floyd, were showing their solidarity actually with the heart of Derek Chauvin who killed him. Yes, they're showing unrighteous hatred for another yeah. group. They're guilty of the same sin that they're judging. Yeah. That's, right. that's what sin does. It blinds us to the truth. Yeah. And no. until we have Christ, we're not going to be able to see it. 
No, that's that's uh, so true, and we need to be on guard as believers. And so, hopefully, if they or anyone else hears this, and if you're a believer and you're struggling through this, our hope and our goal is that you understand that this is based on unbiblical categories. It's based on an unbiblical judgment, and it's based on an unbiblical definition of unity. They're pursuing it, everything's wrong. Yeah, you're not going to be able to achieve that kind of unity because it's not in the bond of the spirit. Yeah. Nope, that ends in ruin. It's not in truth. Ends in ruin. Yeah. All right, next clip here. Need to have conversations with our family. And if I could be so bold to say, um, my white brothers and sisters must have conversations with their family. Um, And and then it just kind of goes out from there in concentric circles. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, and and forgive me in, in these generalizations mm-hmm. yeah yeah sure um, grace just just yeah, <laughs> yeah grace thank you yeah. just just as i say that i could pull my congregation and i could be pretty confident 100 mm-hmm. percent have had a racial experience there might be some that have not but the majority right. have right on the opposite side of that my, with my white brothers and sisters most if not all have been in environments where either they themselves, family members, or someone they know ha- has uh, used a racial slur, made a racial joke, um, talked about a racial yeah. scenario, um, and have many times decided not to say anything, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. perhaps laughed even if they didn't agree yeah. for fear of kind of being the odd person out, uh, whether it's a coworker, a boss, an uncle, a grandfather, a neighbor. Um, this is our opportunity mm-hmm. as the body of Christ in our circles of influence yeah. to begin to speak um, truth in love. You know, Jesus says that he came full of grace and truth, and you never see those words reversed. Mm-hmm. In other words, if you love me, if I know you love me, man, tell me the truth. Mm-hmm. And in these circles of change, circles of influence that we have, there's already love and trust established. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we've just been withholding the truth. Yeah. Well, that'd be a great opportunity there, Pastor Hearn, to speak the truth to him. He just invited you to. So why don't you tell him that we're brothers in Christ? God said that we are to consider no one according to the flesh within the body. And... uh there, there's no basis for us to talk about reconciliation between us. Yeah, it, th- there's a lot. It's, that's very anecdotal, and so, but we don't at the same time, in in seeking to have compassion, we don't want to just dismiss. But it's very anecdotal that every single person there has had a racial experience, right? And and that you know that probably could be true. I mean, I have. I've been made fun of yeah. for being Sicilian before. Yeah, but I don't think that every Hispanic or every black person, because some had made fun of me for that, are now racist because of it. No, and it's not a, a sin exclusive to America. It's just the, the fruit of sinful man. You yeah. think people in China don't judge other races? You no. think uh, African Bushmen don't judge other races? Or if we themselves? go visit in our yeah. uh, you know, Hawaiian shirt and, and khaki shorts that they're not going to laugh about us and call us a whitey or something? Like This is just the fruit of sinful man. Like yeah. It's not unique to America and it's not unique to white people. Why is it my white brothers and sisters must have conversations with their families? Almost all white people have been in an environment, blah, 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 blah. And not black people. Oh, you, you guys don't. So oh, racism doesn't exist in the black population. I guess this is a sin unique to white people. Well, we just saw it come out in the, the city council. Was it in LA? Mm. And it wasn't white people that were making racial jokes. No, no, I didn't hear that. Racial, racial comments. Some of them weren't even jokes. Some of them were just very, uh, very cruel. But yeah, thinking about some of the things to, to, that he said that were good, even though they might have been misplaced, is, yeah, when you're there, if you hear somebody saying something that's racist, don't, out of fear of man, not address that. Right. We're, we're supposed to let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for building up what is needed so that it will give grace to those who hear. Yeah. That's what Ephesians 4.29 tells us. Right. And so, yeah, 
the other area that we see that is gossip. I mean, how many times have you been in a situation where you've been hearing somebody talking about somebody else gossiping? And there's no, there's no aim there that it's for your protection. There's no aim there that this is a necessary information that you need to know to protect yourself. It's just casual, um, uh, like after school kind of um, gossip. I'm, I'm losing the word extracurricular, yeah. kind of something like that. Gossip. Yeah. What what we tend to do is we might smile uncomfortably, it, like he was mentioning with with saying racist things. And yet we should we should be bold for Christ and be able when something is spoken that shouldn't be spoken to in love gently confront that person and just say, hey, I'm just going to have to stop you right there. Right. This needs to be put off. And, and this kind of speaking needs to be put on in its place. But what I'm not going to do is say, well, it was a woman that was gossiping uh, when she said that. Therefore, now all women everywhere right now <laughs> right. need to <laughs> repent of gossip. Right. Right. So I'm not going to go to my, my daughters and say, so this lady at church gossiped. And so now I'm going to need you to repent of gossip too. Mm-hmm. Because that, that's unrighteous judgment. Because women are gossips. Yeah, because one one person or a, a group of people did it. Right, right. No, and uh, you hit the nail on the head there that uh, the the sin that he he touched on is a fear of man, and a fear of man leads to sin, of course, in the one who with the fear, but it also leaves sin unchecked in those around, and we're yeah. to call it out. It's a the scare. the irony. The irony is is that they're sitting down having this conversation because of that sin. The only reason that that white pastor feels obligated to have a black pastor in for a conversation on this issue is because he's fearful of how he's going to be looked if he doesn't. He's or, fearful or he's if he's not being proactive. Right. Yeah. It's either glory seeking. It's all fear of man. Though. It's not biblical. We've established that. It's not biblical. There's no basis to seek reconciliation. And um, they, they, don't need to hash this out as brothers. There's nothing to reconcile. And they were talking about, okay, some of you first steps, okay? You're talking about believers, a group of believers having to do something based on what the world is. So there, there's a fear there. And perhaps, uh, you know, Wendell Robinson, the guest, doesn't correct Pastor Michael Hearn because of fear of man. You know, maybe he had no idea that, you know, no, no intention of going somewhere. And then uh, this Pastor Hearn invited him, and he, he's like, well, it probably shouldn't, but he was scared. I don't know. There's definitely fear of man on one side, if not both. Yeah, we have to be re- really careful in all of this, too. Um, you, and we have to remember this was in a, a certain context, right? This mm-hmm. was in the, with the George Floyd. We can't forget that. And this is with critical race theory ramping up, and we're seeing a lot more of that in Robin DiAngelo's book, White Fragility, yep. and all these things where white people are inherently racist, and so on and so forth. But when we respond because of those things that aren't true, and we're doing it either out of fear of losing something or an opportunity to gain something in the eyes of others, that's pharisaical. It's interesting because a lot of people will say, if you hold to Scripture and seek to do what Scripture says and obey the commands of Christ, people will call you a Pharisee. (laughs) But the Pharisee is the one that does things for the glory of man based upon cultural tradition. Exactly. Even if that's a new tradition that's being started, it's cultural, and you're doing it for the glory of man. That's a Pharisee. Jesus, in no uncertain terms, in John 5, 41 and following, says, I do not receive glory from men, but I know you. You do not have the love of God in yourselves. I've come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you'll receive him. How can you believe? How are you able to believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the only God? He's saying you find glory in man and you have no appetite left for for glory of God because you've already been filled up. Up. You've been, as he puts it in Matthew 6, paid in full. You've already received, you can't get a direct deposit and then cash your stub that looks like a check too. <laughs> right, you don't right. get to do that. Yep. And the way that we seek the glory of God, Paul is helpful in uh, giving us some guardrails here. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive, which means there's going to be an attack. 
See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, and not according to Christ. And what are we seeing? Critical race theory, that underlying worldview and everything that goes with it, is just Marxism repackaged from an economical point of view to a racial point of view. Yep, yep. The, that satan, satanic ideology um, got traction around the world. It didn't get traction in America, largely because we had a free system based on biblical principles that led to um, mo, uh, upward mobility economically. And so, yeah, it fell kind of on deaf ears to the working class. Like, well, I'm making more money than I was two years ago, so I don't know what you're talking about. And so Satan's pretty cunning. He's like, well, yeah. what does America have that I can use to get a foothold? Mm, they've got uh, a history of racism. And it, it's, a, it's a worldview that's based on conflict that, yeah. that thrives on conflict and that has no alternative other than conflict. Right. And as past, you've been talking about them as Christians, but as pastors, one of the qualifications of an elder is that he will hold fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and reprove those who contradict. Be, why? Because why? there's many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers. And yeah. So one of the things that we should expect to hear when we're talking about, okay, there's an issue, uh, and it, it could be ro- racially motivated, but we don't know. How should we address this biblically? How should we take the scripture and have that wash over our minds so that we know how to look at this, so we're not looking at this with the same eyes as the world, Fox News and CNN and all that stuff. How are we gonna look at this situation as Christians? That's what pastors are supposed to do for their people. So even if they did wanna just get together and have a conversation because this stuff is going on, for whatever reason, Okay, it might be questionable, but if they're getting together and saying, hey, we're brothers, we've known each other, we've had a great friendship for a long time, and we know that the media right now is pushing racism, and so we want to be able to help you wade through this situation. Absolutely. So let's bring God's word to bear on this. Absolutely, absolutely. And they they brought very little scripture to this, if any. Um, So, yeah, it's not wrong in and of itself that a white pastor and a black pastor get together and have a conversation on current events. Um, I think it's wrong to do in place of Sunday preaching of the word, but um, it's not wrong just in itself, Correct. but it's what's the basis? What are they pursuing? Yep. What, what message are they saying? Um, so we've got one final clip here that uh, will be useful and it might be, um, might be the worst one, but we'll see. And honestly, if we really want to be honest, we need national repentance. Yeah. Our nation must repent. And I'm talking about on both sides of the argument. There needs to be repentance from our white brothers and sisters, whether we did it or not. And there needs to be repentance on the African-American side because just like me, I've held on to things and I'm, I'm angry. I'm hurt. I'm mad. And yes, I'm a spiritual leader and I have to press through, but you know, this this family book I was talking about. Yeah, so he, it's sad because he said one of his, his best comments in there and then arguably his worst comment in there. So yes, good, he said repent on both sides because there's sin and he acknowledged that, uh, you know, black people who might be overly sensitive and might be using, you know, I don't deny that black people have, you know, had a bad history and you could hear stories from your grandparents and stuff that would, you know, really uh, anger you. But he acknowledges that if they're using that as a basis for unrighteous judgment of your brother today, that that's something to repent of. And so that's a great statement. But he says that white brothers and sisters, you need to repent whether you did it or not. Can you repent without sin? What is repentance? He just demolished the entire doctrine of repentance by saying that you need to repent where there is no sin. You, you can repent where there is no sin. But, but that would be sin. But that would be sin. <laughs> this is why we have to have our mind filled with scripture. Peter, Peter goes over this kind of teaching. I'm not saying that this is true of this individual, but definitely what was just said there. Yep. And, and perhaps he'll come out later and, and, and change I hope he that. does clarify. Um, he says, false prophets also arose among the people, and just as there will also be false teachers among you who will, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, 
even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. And he keeps going, for speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by sensual lusts of the flesh, those who barely escape from the ones who conducted themselves in error, promising them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. Mm-hmm. And Ezekiel 18 when, when the Israelites are saying, well, the only, our fathers ate the sour grapes and our teeth are set on edge. We're being punished for the things that our fathers did. God has to correct them and say, you got to take that proverb out of your mouth. You don't get to say that anymore. The soul that sins will die. And then he gives examples of what that looks like. Mm-hmm. But every, respon- every individual is a responsible agent for their own sin. Right. And you can't repent for a sin you didn't commit. No. Because there are people that don't have any proclivity to racism of, yeah. of every color and class. Yep. They have proclivities to other sin. Right. It's like not everybody it has proclivities to homosexuality or to sexual immorality of any kind right. or to lying or, or anything. Each one of us, we, have, we all have sin and we all have our own proclivities. And so we can't just go and repent of sins that we don't have. If you can come and show somebody, look at this, is, brother, this is your sin. Yeah. This is why it's sin. This is what God says you need to do with it. You need to repent of it and put it off. And this is what you need to put on in its place. And I'd love to come alongside and help you do that. But just carte blanche, everybody needs to repent. Even if you didn't do it. Right. And if you're a baby Christian listening to that and you go through the scriptures and you see repeatedly, oh, repent and believe. Repent and believe. You know, repent of your sins. And then uh, you got a pastor here saying, repent whether you did it or not. How's that going to affect your understanding of biblical repentance? And if that's being taught at that church that he's a pastor at, that's going to fuel what he's saying the people there need to repent of if they have it. Right. If they have that anger and and that hatred and that fear, and they're not seeing people that didn't sin repent of what they didn't do, there's going to be animosity. It's fueling the fire. Right. It's going to create conflict. Right, right. And it's an, an unsustainable argument. So, you know, the slave trade originated, at least the American slave trade originated in Africa. The worldwide slave trade originated with the fall. Uh, but the yeah. American slave trade originated in Africa with blacks enslaving blacks and selling them to Europeans. So I guess blacks need to repent whether they did it or not. That logic would follow. Yeah. If we're to be consistent. Yeah. Yeah. So our hope would be that you think through this biblically, that you understand that, yeah, unity is to be sought. There is a basis for our unity, however, and it needs to be uh, proper and right. He does go on in all fairness in uh, the minutes uh, 103 to 105 to uh, make statements about our um, obligation as believers to be colorblind. That's good, but he's highly inconsistent. The whole basis of him sitting down is not colorblind, right? Yeah. So, um, but I do want to, you know, give credit uh, where where it is due. So, if you only listen to that two minute clip, you'd come away with a pretty good idea. And yeah, we can put the links down. You can listen to the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, we'll put a link in uh, in the description to this service or not service this talk, but it was in exchange in place of a Sunday service. Yeah, we have to be critical thinkers because. Too often people hear slavery and they just go, oh, that's sinful. If just slavery, carte blanche, is sinful, then God's a sinner because he has more slaves than anyone. Yeah, absolutely. Paul says, Paul says um, talking about, I'm not going to do fear of man. I'm not going to fall prey to that. If I was, I wouldn't be a slave of Christ. Yeah. And so many times we, we see that, but that's a different kind of slavery than man-stealing. And so just because you're reading through a historical document or you're seeing that word slave, don't just take, don't do an anachronistic fallacy and take what you have presently and read it back into the past. Get back into that time period and figure out, think critically, is this a kind of slavery that is acceptable where this person is entrusting themselves more like employee, employer, or more like part part of the family, like a servant kind of thing? Right. Or is this slavery an unjust slavery of which what our country had was unjust slavery? It was man-stealing, which is forbidden in scripture. You can't kidnap people. Right. 
It was punishable by death. Yeah. Right. That's what makes the slavery in the American version wrong. Yeah. It was the kidnapping aspect. Yeah. Um, so oh, from scripture, there's just as much of an argument in favor of slavery as there is corporate guilt in American style slavery. Now, the American style slavery and corporate guilt are both wrong. But uh, the Christian in early 1800s who was trying to say that slavery is not wrong has the book of Philemon. He's got uh, slavery that existed uh, in the Old Testament where uh, Israel took slaves when they conquered uh, nations. And so, like, he has, I'm not saying his, you know, application of scripture is right, not at all, but he has just as much of an argument uh, as they do to try to say that you need to repent whether you did it or not. Yeah. Yeah. And they're both wrong. They're both wrong. Yeah. Exactly. We, that's why we have to make sure that we're cutting it straight, that we're an approved workman, not ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth so yep. that we don't fall prey on one side or the other. Amen. Well, hopefully this was uh, beneficial for you. Now we encourage you to pursue unity within your church based on Christ, based on the truths of scripture, that you need to be conformed to the image of him and be of one mind and one judgment and in between churches with the same principle, right? The thing that unites us is Christ. That's where our unity is and we know him through his word. And any division that comes in from the world, from worldly categories is sin. Yep. Absolutely. We can't adopt anything from the world. We need to remember not to pay attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, which means demons teach. Yep. Which is a scary thing to think about. And there's only two sources of doctrine. Yep. God and Satan. No neutrality. Amen. Well, we are encouraged that uh, you guys are here again. And thank you if you made it all the way to the end. We encourage you to comment, like, and subscribe as usual. Um, and uh, ideas for future topics, of course, we encourage you to put down there. We'll respond as quickly as we can. Check out the new merch store. We'll drop the link below. Also, you can get hats and some other stuff there too. Yeah, yeah. It's a work in progress. Yep, yep. We're getting uh, better as we go. We're being sanctified, for (laughs) lack of a better word. But um, it's it's our pleasure to bring this to you, and we have a good one in store for next time as well, so we encourage you to come back. And in the meantime, remember, there is no king but Christ. And be joyfully obedient. God bless you. You need to weigh in on the cost factor and count the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It will cost you popularity. It will cost you promotion, perhaps, at times. It will cost you an easy life. You will have to discipline yourself. You will have to buffet your body. You will have to say no to temptation. You will have to say no to this world. You will have to break with the crowd. You will have to be willing to stand alone for Christ. You will have to be willing to walk to the beat of a different drummer and to to step out of the crowd even if no one follows after Jesus Christ. You'd be willing to stand if you're the only person in the world for Jesus Christ. That's the cost factor.